So, all right, so we've actually going to go back, now that we've learned the stuff about chapters six and seven, we're going to go back and we're going to apply those integrated rate equations to the data that you've already collected. And so here's an example of Rian's data that we have here. And I've got my little USB mouse that I'm going to bring over. Um, and now I found it. So, so now you're going to be able to use that on one of the two computers that's there. And so um, let me just show you what you do. You find the plot that has the, the best fits, the best shark fin shapes. If you have one of these that doesn't really look like it's doing a shark fin, you can get rid of it later. And in fact, the first thing I'm going to show you how to do is remind you how to edit working set because we have the blank still down there on the bottom. But because they were all labeled before, we can just remove, say OK. And there we go. We have our uh, a nice little thing. The important thing to look at is at the very bottom, do you actually see a curve in the bottom data? Right here, I'm not entirely sure that we have a concentration that we can actually see the curve for. These are uh, on the dilute end of what we usually do. Um, and so I'm going to be looking at this one questioningly as we try to fit it. So um, double check that you're still nice and zeroed over here. It looks like you, we are. And everything looks good for this. You can, al you can always go back and forth and you can edit individual curves. The only thing to remember is if you're editing one of these individual curves, you can call it up individually and edit, edit it individually. Um, but you have to realize it's going to affect all of the plots built from that curve. And um, that's actually usually what you want. If you have the curve sort of disagreeing, especially if you look at the slopes, um, I mean, I'm not sure if this is flat or not, but at least I don't have the slopes disagreeing. When you have the low concentrations, sometimes you'll have one going up when it should be going down, and going up will not fit kinetically. Okay, so if you have it going up at all, you can go ahead and get rid of it. And you can also do something really weird, um, like if you have the dissociation phase that's giving you trouble, you can actually open that uh, curve up individually and delete the control X out the entire dissociation phase. Sometimes that gives you an error and sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes that means you can have the association phase in there, which actually contains the dissociation kinetics in there because that reaction is still going on. And so it's actually it might be a valid thing to do if, if one part of it's giving you trouble, you might be able to keep the other half. But all these, let's see how this looks when we fit the kinetics. And so you click on the fit kinetics, the shark fin button up there. Fit kinetics simultaneous, KA, KD. So you're fitting all the concentrations at once. You're trying to find parameters of KA and KD that will fit the entire shape of all these curves. You're looking at eight regions, two regions per concentration that it's going to be fitting for. Um, and so it says to get your data ready, you've already done that. So you just say next. And here what you do is you select the beginning and end of each reaction and it tries to guess for you. It does a really terrible job, you can see. In fact, I don't know why this is, it's not even, oh, there it is. The, the hand is for the bars and the arrow is for the gray. So the, the, um, the bars are where the actual reaction stops and starts and the gray is where you're going to fit the data for. So you always want to give a little bit of margin. You can see on the edge of the margins, we have these little spikes there. That's clearly not real data. But we want to try putting the beginning of the reaction right on the spike. And then we get as much of the data as we can, leaving a little bit of margin for the part where it's still sort of recovering from the spike. I mean, if you can look at this and you can say, oh, that looks like real data. Those all look like real data. And you see that we have a slight crossover right here. Uh, that could cause a problem. Maybe I want to move my data to be more to the right to start fitting more to the right if this gives me a problem. But I don't think it's going to give me a problem. Basically, you're telling the computer, where do you think real data is? And you're using your pattern recognition to kind of see that. Now for the dissociation phase, you don't want to include too much of this. You definitely don't want to include all the way over here because this is washed data. But even this is too much right here because this is um, including a lot of this later phase and it's also including more dissociation data than you have association data. 
I think that unfairly weights the dissociation. So what I usually try to do is I try to make my dissociation bar fit my association bar. And don't forget to look at this end of things as well. You have the spike is still sort of affecting how things drop off. And so uh, looking up and down, it looks like this is actually a pretty good uh, representation of what's really going on. We kind of have a little drop once we move from association to dissociation, but I don't think that's a real part of the data. It looks like something from the instrument rather than something from the data. So this is my best guess at what this fits. And then what you do is you, do, um, you select the model. For us, we select the simplest uh, kinetic model, which is one-to-one -one Langmuir binding. And we have all of our concentrations. Just double check that those match what they should. And then you say OK. And then you get this. So looking at this, the question is, is does this collect what's really going on? Now, we're not getting all this, but this is sort of an irreversible part of the phase anyways. So I'm not that worried about not, uh, not collecting this end of the phase, because I didn't tell it to even look at that. You know, the, the fit probably could be better right here. And I'm wondering, maybe I should um, even shorten this up a little more. But I think that this is actually fine as it is. You know, uh, it's looking at things like where the black line and the colored lines, how closely the black line approximates the colored lines. And you see you actually have a pretty close approximation for the three lowest ones. You can do your usual sort of going in and out. And the most important thing is to check uh, on your this is your k values for your, um, well, actually, this might be your k on. Oh, no, it's your kd. So th this is reporting an over, a global ka and kd, k on and k off. And here is actually the local k on that it's uh, looking at. And you can see, is there a big variation in these? They're actually within about an order of magnitude. And the most important thing is that the lowest one the 50N is not distinctly different from the other ones. It's sort of in line with the other ones. And so the, the bottom one can sometimes fit it to a straight line. If you don't have enough of a slope in the data, it can just say that I'm fitting it to zero. And when you're fitting it to zero, like it will come out as like e to the negative 5 instead of e to the negative 3. When you have two orders of magnitude difference, you're talking about a real difference there. Here, these are close enough to the same value, and you see that these are sort of, uh, if you relate these to this, yeah, it looks like if I average these out, I get this. And so I have some, some differences, and the top one is the one where I have the most difference, and that's where I observe the most difference, where I have that second phase that I have to regenerate off. And so um, this actually looks pretty good to me. I might be able to fiddle around with it a little bit more to try sh possibly shortening up the shortening up the length or actually let's try let's try lengthening it up because it's really easy. You just do the exact same thing again and we can take this and lengthen it out to now include more of that. That feels like too much. But let's do let's do about that. So now we're talking about one and a half times the association phase is what we're doing the dissociation. And um, we just click fit, and it puts this up as fit two. And I can go back and forth between the fits. This changes my KD. The, the important thing is, is it really changing my KD? It's changing it from 5.9, that square right there, to 4.7. Not that big of a difference. Uh, and so that's the, the biggest thing. You can fiddle around with this infinitely. But if it's OK, you know, if it's okay, it's okay. You know, it's that kind of thing. Don't let the topmost one, the topmost one is the hardest one to fit. Don't let that one mess you up if the other ones are looking okay like this one is. I still like the first one better though, if you, if you look at that. Um, the other thing is actually, and might as well do another one. The other option I have is I could include less of the beginning stuff. It's possible that this initial spike is messing things up a little more. And so I'm going to try that again. Doesn't seem to do anything. Okay. Um, eventually what you do is you, you pick what you think your best fit is. And just like before, you go to the parameters tab. And now you have errors and parameters for three different things. You have the R max, the KA, and the KD. All of these should be same order of magnitude as if you're collecting multiple data. Again, don't worry if you have a twofold difference. 
or even a five-fold difference. But if you have a ten-fold difference, especially if your error is really big, um, then you start to worry. But it looks like my errors are reasonable, and it looks like um, my R max is reasonable. So basically, I would copy and paste this into the Excel sheet. And the Excel sheet is automatically set up. If you copy and paste into the right places, it will automatically do all of these calculations for you. So the lab report is going to be about getting into Excel. I left one part of the Excel sheet for you to do. That's the equilibrium calculations. So you can look and see um, after you see the pattern for all the complex kinetic calculations. Then you can go back and do the simpler version. Basically, you're converting a K to a delta G. And we always know what the temperature is, by the way. Um, you can see the examples for the complex, and I want you to do that for a simple case. You calculate everything for each individual replicate. So like this would be one replicate that I would do. And then uh, the sheet is set up so that it will take the replicates and it will average them together. And that will be, I want you to do one more thing with that. I want you to take that. Actually, I should probably show you. I should probably show you. I'm not sure if I did control C. Where is 3410? Oh, I'm all the way down at the bottom because I clicked on the folder. Here's a template that I made available on Canvas. So basically what I want you to do is I want you to replace the blue boxes. You know, don't forget to replace some of the things, um, like some of the things up here. But for the most part, let me make sure that I actually copied this. Control C. And this is the one step kinetics. So I'm going to go and I'm going to put down here. I'm going to do it in. And, and the, the thing is, there's other data here. So I want to actually clear these contents. And now it's automatically calculating my KD, my standard error of KD, and my delta G. OK? I want you to take this. And let me show you one thing I want you to do. I want you to take the orange one after you've done all of this and copy it into the results table. Now, what you do for this one is you actually will um, do Alt H V. Oh, and I did, did the wrong thing. Escape out of it. You want to do a paste transpose values. You want to paste the values and you want to transpose them at the same time. I want to make sure it still has that in the clipboard. So you go to the top of this and you, you do, um, you follow this sequence up in the, in the upper left. Alt H V S. And oh, actually there's, there's more that you can do. But now that I've gotten to this, I want to paste values and I want to transpose. That's what the hotkeys should do. And now I've uh, actually put it up and down, and I've, I've, pa I've pasted it into this bar. The one thing, oh, it's Alt HVS EV is what it will do that automatically. Or you can paste special and select both transpose and paste values. Now, I shouldn't have done that, actually. This is made for the two-step data, is what I forgot. So I'll show you that again in a second when we do the two-step data. The two-step data is just a variation of the, the previous one. You actually do fit kinetics. We keep the same thing here. You might want to include a little more of the dissociation phase, just because you're going to be fitting both parts of the dissociation phase here. And then what you do is you go through and you do two-state co reaction confirmation change. And that looks a little bit better, but you're also giving the fit more freedom. So again, you want to look down here, and now instead of uh, KAs and KDs, you have KA1 and KD2. You have four things to copy. Okay? Um, but our R maxes are pretty similar. We can look up and down. We can see that the, the RIs, and it's giving me a K, but the thing is it actually doesn't calculate this right. So I'm going to the, the parameters tab again. I'm going to copy all the data here directly from here and uh, you're going to start with the R max bar and you see that it all automatically does all those calculations for you I'm gonna I'm gonna keep these contents I'm not going to clear them um, because I want to show you what to do with this data but it's going to calculate all this stuff out here which are all these different things but they all are in physical chemistry terms and so you have 
delta G1 and delta G2. It's calculating free energies for the different steps. And it even goes and it calculates delta G transition state on and off, which it does from the K on and the K off. But you can see that if you go in here, this is the formula. This calls different cells in. And so this is where the math of this comes in. It's not doing your own math as much as it is reconstructing the math that's in the sheet. I'm going to copy the orange line just to show you how it's done, how it should be actually be done. Alt H V S E V. Let's see if it works. Alt H V S E V. And see it automatically selects those and then you say OK. And then it's posted your data down. You have one more thing to do. Because of a decision, oh actually that, that works. I thought that I had to like delete stuff here and like go back and forth and, and delete things. But I don't have to because um, I've actually made it easier for you. You just have to follow the steps. And if you follow it from this cell, it will automatically paste your R max, your K1, your K minus one, and with the errors below it. This is so I can take your data and I can actually take all your data and I can mess around with it later. So I'm going to want this with what you've done for it. Um, and don't forget to fill in a title for each one because that will help me when I'm doing it. Basically, that is what you do. Uh, the only th other thing is when you're looking at this fit, notice as well that there are two curves here. Now we have this much better fit because we have this long curve fit with a, a big curve, but look at the errors on each of them. The KD2, well, it fits really nicely, but it has a big error. And it's also pretty flat, 10 to the minus 4. Are we really measuring anything there? That's why I might not use the two-step fits. Um, if you look at the other errors, though, uh, they seem to be in order. But don't, w w uh, you know, don't waste too much time trying to get low errors for the two-step fits because they're probably pretty sketchy to begin with. But they're really cool math. And in some cases, they can actually be justified. But we actually wouldn't need to justify that. So basically, and the only th other thing is to remember, don't close any of this. Save it all. And by the way, I would say this is fit seven, curve four, and it would be nice to put that right here in parameters from uh, on the very left side of things. It says which cycles. I would probably say here fit seven, curve four. And now I have other information to tell me somewhere on the sheet which BLE file this comes from so I know what's what. And part of that's going to be up there, but um, Feel free to give me more information rather than less uh, so that I can reconstruct what's going on. Ultimately, I will want that BLE file to be saved and then to be um, given back to me. You can upload them to Genie, but honestly, uh, what Samuel did was just zip them all up and emailed them to me. That works fine. So um, you can do whatever at this point. Uh, I just will want all of your uh, files and uh, the one thing that gets confusing is, is this, well, I, I had the date stamps on them, so I'll be able to tell if it was an equilibrium fit only or if it also includes the kinetic fits. Technically, your kinetic fits are superimposed on top of the equilibrium fits, so I'm getting them both ways, what, uh, the, the equilibrium when you send them to me. Um, yeah, feel free to move the data around between sets, but do try to get like a good, like what we just showed right there is a good example of a good set of data right there. And watch out for the bottom line being flat, because if the bottom line's flat, it's going to mess up everything else. Better to throw it out than to force it to fit a flat line. Okay. 10 to the minus 5, by the way, is flat. That 10 <laughs> to the minus 4 was close to flat right there. When you see 10 to the minus 5, you start to say, am I really seeing anything? But that may just invalidate your two-step fit if you can't you can shrink the end of it a little bit. If it's too flat, you're getting too much of this part over, over here. So you can shrink this end to get less of that. All right. Any questions before we're overrun by the next class? Can you ask me about the presentation? Yeah. I, I, um, um, so uh, let, let me stop recording this if there's no questions about this. All right. And what's your question about?